Thank you. 
Is it working now? I think it's working now. Okay. It didn't work at first. I don't know why. That's weird. All right. So, hey, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Um, as you saw from that uh, opening little thing there, there is something I want to talk about. Um, I hope I didn't build up the anticipation too much because I don't have any like hot takes or like good explainers to share with you if you're interested in trying to understand what's going on with the stock market. But it did seem like there's a thing happening on the internet this week, and so it, it, I would be remiss if I didn't, didn't at least acknowledge that. But I do have some things to share about it, but I need to go close this door because there's a lot of yelling in my house right now for some reason. I'll be right back. Yes, I will turn on the music, don't worry. Um, the issue that I was just experiencing was um, my daughter's friend comes over a lot, and that's great, but like they, um, you know, she's not supposed to be inside without a mask. She usually forgets her mask, so she's like standing at the door with it open. It's very cold. She's standing there like yelling um, into the house because <laughs> she's not, she knows she's not supposed to come in without her mask, and so, you know. She's just doing that instead. I think that's what's happening. Anywho, um, I said anywho. I'm Ned Flanders apparently today. Uh, good afternoon. This is Applied Digital Studies Section 1. And today I'm going to be talking about a few things, um, kind of logistically, kind of organizationally, kind of continuing the line of thought and discussion that we started on Wednesday with um, with the, the Zoom conference. Basically, uh, there's still a little bit more I want to know from you all in terms of your plans for this class and the different mod modalities that I plan to offer. Um, so I am going to ask you a little bit about that, but I also want to present to you a plan, an idea, and see what you think of that and see you know what we can do with it. So uh, let's actually, let's before I get started, I wanted to share, this is a bit of a commercial break um, sort of, but not really. Some of you, if you're in my ELIT class, you saw this this morning, but I wanted to share with you all as well something pretty cool that I got to experience last night and I wanted to share it with you and um, uh, make sure you know that it exists. So there is this place called Reclaim Arcade. They are opening today. Uh, th I got to go in and check things out last night. Um, this is a company that's a spin off or a side venture of Reclaim Hosting. They're a web hosting company that provides the back end for UMW domains and a bunch of other schools. And as a side venture, uh, you know, they're based in Fredericksburg. And as a side venture, they've got a arcade that you can go play video games at. And I uh, got to check it out last night, and it is incredible. If you like video games, or especially retro games, it's more retro focused. Um, most of their games are from like 1990 or earlier, um, but they have 57 or so. I think last night they had 57 that were online and working. It's a it's a free to play kind of situation. You so you, you pay a flat fee now that they're open, and you can play for two hours. But they've also got uh, Reclaim Video, which is kind of an art project essentially right now. It's a, a VHS rental store, so if you want to rent a tape, you can. Like if you have a VCR that you can play a tape on, you can rent a tape from them if you were wondering how to do that. Um, you can also hang out in the space called the console living room, which is a space that's inspired by and a recreation of a space that we made. Uh, I say we because I was involved in this. Me, me and Jim Groom created this project uh, a few years ago at UMW, this place called the console living room. Um, it has survived in various forms in the fourth floor of the Convergence Center, but it's pretty much never quite um, gotten back to that same glory that it originally had. But it is uh, bigger and better than ever at uh, Reclaim Arcade, so you can hang out in a a living room styled after the late 70s if you want to. Uh, they don't have wood paneled walls yet, but they've got lots of wooden furniture and tweed furniture and it's great. Uh, but the main attraction of course is the video games. They got lots of them and there's they got a lot of pinball machines too if you like that kind of thing. So check it out. It's a very exciting opportunity to explore and learn about video game history and culture. So you should uh, check it out. It's great. So anyway, that was my brief little ad there. I just wanted to share that I had a lot of fun uh, and I uh, got to visit them. The two owners, Jim and Tim, uh, you know, they're friends of mine, and Jim lives in Italy, but he was able to come over and to be there for uh, the, the open house last night, and so it was cool to see Jim. 
and um, yeah, play some video games. So today is the end of the first week or the last day of the first week of Applied Digital Studies. Uh, this is Friday. It's um, partly cloudy, I would say, and uh, pretty cold and pretty windy. And it looks like there's a good chance of snow for the weekend. Um, I haven't checked lately, but last I checked on Weather Underground, they were saying it could be a few inches. So let me see, let me take a look. I think that's changed. Um, I, I do have the, the bird feeder cam on right now. Um, yeah, now it's saying 4.8 inches on Sunday on um, on Weather Underground, but then it turns into rain, so that could kind of wash things out too. So pretty uh, ugly, yucky looking win weekend in terms of winter weather. Um, uh, many of you may be moving in on Sunday when it's going to be raining and snowing, so that's kind of a drag, but you know, at least you get to move in, I guess. Um, although I think I heard that you might be able to move in a bit early because of the weather, so hopefully that goes okay. Um, I got the bird cam on. I, I don't know if you saw, but yesterday I actually did see a couple birds on the bird feeder, so I turned on the webcam, I mean, on the I turned on the live stream so it would send that out and, you know, seemed to, you know, I got, I got like, uh, six minutes of bird footage, so that was pretty exciting. Uh, by the way, I can see a lot of you are online, but uh, it would be great if you don't mind just say hi either on the Twitch or um, Discord, just so I kind of know who I'm talking to, but I do see many of you are online, uh, so that's good, so thanks. Hello, Pikachu's heart. <laughs> and Ashley, <laughs> thank you for doing that. Uh, it's always good for me to kind of get that sense that there's an audience, um, so that's good. Um, thank you. And tell me if you see anything on the bird feeder. I've got the curtain closed because I think if I have it open, they actually can see me and that might be a, a factor that in discourages them from hanging out. So, uh, I've got it closed right now, but if you see one, let me know and I'll, I'll make the, I'll switch to the bigger view of it. It's over there. It's going to be way over there in the corner, um, of your view. So tell me if you see anything. Um, so, oh yeah. And then firecracker on the Twitch and asked what was the application I was using. That's called Pretzel Rocks. Or I think it's just Pretzel Rocks or I don't know, but it's, it's pretzel.rocks and it's a, um, it's kind of like Spotify except that everything, and I think it is actually somehow hooked into Spotify, but um, the, the way it works is that you can set it so that you, you can um, choose a couple options, but basically the music is all supposed to be licensed free. So like, you can play it on Twitch without getting a copyright takedown notice or, or on YouTube without getting a copyright thing. So it's like a, a uh, streaming music kind of designed for people doing video streams uh, to help them uh, do that legally. So that's what that is. I, and it, like the, what, it, what I found right now, th that music, the station I was playing just then was the elevator station. And I found that it actually only has two songs in that station because it's, I just went back and forth a couple of times. But if you turn it off, um, if you turn off YouTube safe mode, you get a lot more options. So that was, that's all I found out so far, but it's, you know, it's a good sort of background music, but it actually has a lot of really good music in it. Um, like on Monday I was playing, uh, music by, uh, Chipzell. She's a chiptunes artist who I like a lot. So, um, she's got a lot in here that are for, are free for, for streaming and can be played on Twitch for free and also YouTube. So great stuff. Um, she did the soundtrack for super hexagon, which is one of my favorite video games. So that's how I know of her work. Um, okay, cool. So let's talk about a few things. Um, a couple of things just kind of logistically and schedule wise, obviously, you know, we're wrapping up week one. Um, going forward, Discord is going to remain the common denominator. So on class, whether you're coming in person or doing something online, um, you should always kind of keep in mind Discord as the kind of fundamental assumption. You should always try to have access to that. Um, that's going to pretty much always be there. Um, I've started going to uh, I've got, started going through the the roster and then the list of people in our server, and I'm trying to identify which section you're in and then assign you a role based on that. Um, that is a work in progress because I was trying to do it last night and I kept falling asleep. And so I would get like, I would like do a bit and then I would wake up and realize that I had been asleep for 10 minutes. So that's that was my struggle last night, but uh, I wanna work through that and get you all labeled. That's just gonna be an easy way for me to say at section one, at section two, and also you will be able to at each other. And I will also add additional roles, I think, but that's the, um, you know, the basic structure that I think will be useful to reference. So that's gonna be a part of Discord. 
So you know, it, but all, so far all that means is that you're you're color coded. And I think I got most of the way through section one. So you can see if you're in section one, you're kind of a pinky purple color, um, and that's gonna you can see that when your names are printed above in the uh, the stream chat. Um, other the other class I'm gonna make a different color, but I don't, I think I didn't get to them yet. <laughs> all right, so no worries. Um, so. Uh, a couple other things. I'm still working on the content for next week. I said I would have it done by today. I'm sorry I don't. It was a very long day yesterday. Um, but I'm going to get that together and start really on in earnest on Monday. And I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts today that will help you get ready for that. So uh, that's going to be kind of what we do um, for most of today, hopefully. But uh, a couple other kind of logistical things first. So first, so I'm going to do a quick poll. Um, I was interested in talking in Zoom. Uh, in my initial survey that I sent out, I asked for your availability to see if you would be available Monday, Wednesday, or Friday. Um, and I think some of you said yes, but I think what you meant was yes, but I would prefer to stay online. Um, in other words, some of you may not have understood or realized that that, that is an option, that you can, can, can participate in this class fully remotely. Um, but I really, I need to get a better picture of how many people plan to do that. Uh, I'm not asking. I'm still not asking you to commit to anything yet, but I am going to put a poll up here in Discord, uh, just briefly. Uh, it's going to take me a second to type it, uh, but just to give me a quick straw poll sense of how many people I would expect to show up face to face if I offered that opportunity. All right, so uh, let me type it for a second. Um, is that a hawk? I think I just heard a hawk outside. It sounded really close. That's why I was checking the feeder, but I didn't see it. Oh, well. um. Okay, so the way this poll is going to work is I'm going to create um a couple of options and they will be indicated by emoji reactions so i'm going to after i finish typing this, these instructions um, then i'm going to react to the message that i that i'm typing with both of those and then you click the one that corresponds to your response. So you'll see what I mean in a second. Um, so it's going to be click on the laptop if you plan to click on the laptop if you plan to participate fully online. Click on the picture of a school building if you plan to attend uh, face to face. All right. So I'm going to add this um, reaction here, and then there we go. So click on whichever, and I'm making those options are both available, but I need to understand how many are in each group. So please do that. Nothing commit, you're not committing into anything yet. And this is just another straw poll to kind of see where everyone is and where the numbers are going. So give you all a chance to do that for a second. While I peek outside again. I don't know, I did see at least two hawks in the neighborhood yesterday. Um, it was super windy, so there were tons of birds, I think, because it was windy, there's a ton of birds. Um, we have a flock of black vultures that are, are, I guess, spending the winter in our neighborhood, so that's kind of creepy. Um, but there's also, you know, the standard turkey buzzards. I saw some of those. I think I saw an eagle, too, among all them, but it's hard to tell from the ground um, from as far away as it was, but it looked like it, you know, had the white head, and the wing shape was different than the buzzards and the, the black vultures. So I think it was an eagle, but I definitely saw two hawks, and um, I also saw, um, yeah, lots of crows and other random things but anyway if by the way you're in if you're watching only in twitch like if you don't if it's not easy to switch to discord in order to vote just tell me in um just the just type in the twitch chat whichever one you prefer online or in person uh, or like and this is you know for the whole semester um because it looks like i've got seven i got 13 responses so far in discord so that and i've got 19 viewers so there's about six people that might still need to reply if you're still on the fence i'm not going to force you to commit to anything but Make sure you tell me now so I can get a sense of it. Because what it looks like is if there's fewer than 12 in the face-to-face -face cohort, uh, there's no reason to split that up, which is what I'm basically trying to figure out. So, okay, thanks, Matt. 
Oh, I got a cookie. The biggest, the biggest cookie. <laughs> Thank you. I got a cookie. Um, <laughs> sorry, I can't share. I didn't bring enough for everyone. Um, but my daughter makes cookies now. This is like her thing. She got a, a book, like a baking book, like a book of recipes. And so she's been, she's been baking like crazy. And I certainly don't mind. This is a peanut butter cookie. I just, <laughs> excellent. Yeah, sorry, I can't share. But but curious shared, so there, you know, that's a, a cookie you all can have. I'll, I'll, I'll add a few more. Um, ah. Cookies for everyone. I'm just adding a few more here to the chat. Um, so you're welcome to grab one of those. <laughs> uh, not really, you can't. Um, okay, so good. So it looks like actually the numbers of people that are, are hoping for um, in person is actually less than 12. 12 is the cutoff. So that's about what I expected. And in fact, that gives us, that's actually good in the sense that it gives me some flexibility. Um, or it means that I don't have to worry too much about the schedule, which is, um, I think will make a little bit more sense if I go here to the next slide. So here's the plan, uh, my idea for what a typical week is gonna look like. It may change, I, I imagine. I, I think I'll probably go ahead and predict that we'll do this for at least a month and then kind of reassess and see if it's still the way we want to do things. Um, but let's. This, this is what I propose starting this next week. So starting like um, Monday. So Monday will be a fully online class, synchronous. Uh, Friday will be a fully online class and synchronous. Um, the three platforms that I think we will use would be Twitch or Zoom or Discord. And I will, of course, tell you ahead of time which it is that we need, but my feeling is that I don't have to tell you too far ahead of time because in your case, it's pretty much you click the link uh, to join a Zoom conference or to turn on Twitch. So I'm hoping that that's not something I need to spell out too much in advance, but just, you know, those are the three options. They're pretty much equal in terms of getting to them. So I hope that's all right. Um, but on Wednesday, what I'm thinking is um, make it an optional face-to-face -face class uh, the main thing to think through is like, what are the benefits of face-to-face? -face? And we mentioned some of that in the Zoom conference yesterday or Wednesday. Um, a lot of it is, I think, discussion and troubleshooting. Um, I think discussion, if we're actually having a conversation as opposed to me explaining things and you listening, um, discussions, of course, can happen face-to-face -face, and sometimes that's much, much more efficient and we can get more people involved. We can have sometimes better ideas exchanged in a face-to-face -face conference, conversation than we can online. That's not always the case. I think sometimes online conversations have advantages too, but you know, certainly we, we are used to the face-to-face -face experience. Um, I think what I might do is actually just make a sign-up sheet essentially, uh, maybe sign-up genius or something like that, just so I kind of know who to expect. Um, but I won't, since the numbers are low in the sense of who wants to attend that option and it's unlikely that we will accidentally exceed the limit, um, I don't think I'm going to ask you to commit to face-to-face -to -face ahead of time for the whole semester but maybe take it on a week by week basis. So if there's some Wednesday when you feel like, yeah, I'm fine, and you don't wanna come in, that's okay. Um, if it starts to looking like there's only one person coming face to face or, or no one, then I will just do a online synchronous experience instead. Um, Cause I don't wanna, I mean, I wanna be there for people who want me there, but I also don't wanna kind of leave everyone else hanging. So, uh, but we'll try it for now. And then um, I'll create some kind of sign up sheet or something in Canvas maybe that'll give you a chance to say that you're plan on, planning on coming. But I'll start on Wednesday, this coming Wednesday. Uh, we meet in HCC 327, uh, the Convergence Center. Um, if you've never been there before, uh, let me know and I can give you kind of the basics of how to get there. Um, I, I think many of you have been there before, so that should be okay. Um, but the basics of the room are, as you hopefully know, we, we have to do the mask, masking and distancing thing. So you can only come in person if you have to wear a mask if you plan on coming in person. Um, there will be uh, hand sanitizer everywhere and uh, dis disinfectant wipes at the door. So you grab a sheet on your way in, wipe down your area, and then uh, wipe it down again when you leave. And you know, that's it pretty much. Um, so that should be interesting and, and a good opportunity perhaps uh, to get to know some people and say hello and chat about things. But that'll be Wednesdays only. Uh, that's my, my proposal here. All right, that's also, that's parallel with my electronic literature class, which I know some of you are in as well. So my, my, my thinking there is basically Wednesday is the day that I will be on campus for teaching and other days, not necessarily. 
Okay, so any questions or thoughts on that as a, a potential plan? I will take another bite of my cookie while you're thinking. So good. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry to be eating on the stream here, but it's like crunchy on the edges, you know, like like chewy, but not like soft chewy, but like chewy in the middle. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about a couple of things. Um, one of the things that we're going to be doing in the first module or the first node, and I'm going to keep going back and forth on the terminology, but the first chunk, uh, let's say, is we're going to be learning about algorithms and what they are, how they express ideas about culture, how they shape and give um, structure to various aspects of a reality without us realizing it. Um, and so part of what we're going to do there is actually learn how they work by learning a bit of programming. And part of what that is is going to be, you know, you writing some code and trying to understand how code works and how to use it and how the kinds of codes that are actually happening when we talk about algorithms are in many cases pretty accessible and readable. In some cases, they're really opaque and really hard to read. Uh, and it doesn't have to do necessarily with the language that's being used, but sometimes the intentions of the person who created it. Um, all this is to say we are going to do a bit of programming and we're going to be starting that next week. Um, but this is not a programming class, as I've, I continue to say, it still is not a programming class, and yet there is programming, and we want to understand the kinds of things that we can do with programming, the kinds of questions we can explore with programming that we can't do as easily with other media. So um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not going to be too bad, I hope, in other words. So to do this, the program that we're going to use to do programming is something called, called Collaboratory Notebooks. So I thought I'd give a quick overview of this platform and show you how to do this a little bit. You're welcome to follow along and do this as I do it, but you don't have to necessarily yet if you don't feel like it. Um, yeah, you can certainly take notes, Amber, or you could follow along with what I'm doing. Um, either way, um, I think I would probably recommend taking notes instead of following along because if you try to get if you follow along, you might get off on a step and that might be a little confusing. Um, so this is I'll, I'll, I'll type the link here in Discord. Yeah, so you can watch it back later. And, and this is not going to be a very technical demo right now. Um, let's see. So you will need to be logged into a Google account to do this. So if you don't already have a Google account, you probably should get one. But um, it's not super urgent if you don't want to do that yet, if you want to wait and figure that out later. But I imagine many of you do have Google accounts. I believe, and I, uh, I have a, I've had a Collab account for a while, so I don't know for sure. But I believe if you go to that particular page, it will allow you to create a new notebook and then start working with one if you want to. But again, I'm going to show you some things. You don't have to do what I'm doing right now. Um, just kind of watch what I'm doing. I need to close the door again. <laughs> but I am the only parent home right now, so I have to uh, sort of pay attention, but not, not too much attention. OK, so Collab Notebooks. Let's take a look at what we can do with this. Oops, not yet. Um, let's go here. So this is hopefully going to be the main page. Yeah, here we go. Um, so you should see something like this. If you don't, don't worry about it too much yet. I'm just, I think this is how it gets started. Um, it might look slightly different, but as you can see, I already have an account. You can tell I'm logged in. I actually, I have a Google Colab Pro account. The differences are actually not that important between the regular and the pro account, unless you're getting into machine learning, which is what I, I'm trying to do with mine. But what uh, you can do here, you should see a few sample notebooks, but I'm going to make one here called just with a, this link here to a new notebook. And I want to show you what this is, kind of walk you through the interface mainly and kind of talk about in general what a collab notebook is. Um, you'll see what we're going to be doing this, what we're going to be doing with this later. I'm trying to separate those conversations out because I don't want to get bogged down yet in, in algorithms and code and stuff like that yet. I just want you to understand kind of where we're going to be having that conversation because if you're new to CodeLab Notebooks in the environment, kind of taking on both things at once can be a little confusing, I think. So let's just kind of start with this as a, as a place. Okay, so I'm going to walk through the different parts of this. Um, you will recognize many aspects of the interface if you are used to using Google Docs or Slides. Some of these things are pretty similar, right? So we've got the title up here uh, and you can uh, notebook. Um, these have a specific file extension, which is IPYNB. That's actually kind of a legacy, but it's something that makes these interchangeable with other notebook platforms, which is kind of 
you know, on the point of this the demo today, but don't just leave it leave it there. Basically, is the recommendation. And uh, much like uh, a Google Doc, you can share it. Uh, it's got the same kind of sharing interface. So um, when you are working on these later, eventually, I'm going to ask you to create these and then share them with me, so I can kind of see what you've done. And then, uh, yeah, you know, basics that you can do. Um, you've got a few more menus and things here that are a little different than what you would see in um, uh, Google Doc. And the main thing is that this is uh, a platform where we can do two things at once. We can write content like you can with a Google Doc, but we can also run code, which is something you normally can't do in a Google Doc. In order to run code, what we have to do is actually connect this interface to a virtual computer on Google's platform somewhere. So before we can really do anything, we have to fire up that computer, which you do with this button here that says connect. Um, this actually, the connection will happen as soon as you try to write code anyway, but um, I'm just gonna go ahead and click it now because under the runtime menu, this is all th these all these commands here, all these instructions have to do with that computer that we're connecting to in the back end. Usually you won't have to deal with that or make any changes to that, but that's what that's what that is basically. Okay, so I'm kind of working my way towards the middle, working my way around the interface here. Um, this is where we can learn about this computer that we're running this code on. Um, this over here on the left is where we can do various things related to this document that we're creating. And one of the most important things that you may find yourself doing here is uploading files. Uh, if you click on this folder over here, you have a little file browser. So you remember this is connecting to a computer on Google's server farm somewhere. Over here on the left, we can see the files and folders on that computer. You can also connect it to your Google Drive so you can see your actual Google Drive folders. So that's to say we are not automatically accessing the files that live inside of your Google Drive. You have to do that with this button here. Um, but until you do that, and if you don't need to do that, you shouldn't, uh, you can just upload files like you can in other contexts, I suppose. But the up arrow that's going to upload a file, if I click that, I don't know if you can see the pop-up, but it has popped up a, uh, a browser for me, and then I can click that. Um, this note here is important. It does say that uploaded files are going to get recycled, so this is a temporary file storage area. And there it is. <laughs> I have a file here called poem a.txt. I don't remember what file that is. But you can see it here, All right? Um, I'm uploading a file into this temporary storage area. If I restart the runtime, it'll get deleted. Or if I walk away uh, after a couple hours, the runtime will recycle all the files and it'll be gone. All right, so this is all still feeling pretty abstract, I think. I'm, I'm kind of working my way towards the part where you actually do things with it. Um, but if, there is, if everybody's okay, I'm gonna keep going through. Um, oh, I just saw a question in Twitch. Um, in person is only once a week. I think that's, that's Hannah who had that question. Yeah, uh, instead of three, that's the correct. So Isabella is, I think, giving you the thumbs up to say yes, that's the idea. Um, okay, so that's, because that's that seems like the best way to give you all you know access to content. All right, so this is the essence of a Google Colab notebook here, this part here in the middle. And you've got two different kinds of content that you can create. And you can see them here, plus code and plus text. Um, usually when I give you a notebook, it's gonna have some text already in it. And when I do that, um, I'm going to create it this way. I click plus text, and then I get a little text cell I can start writing in, and I can say, hello, this is text. And it shows, a, shows me on the right a preview of what it's gonna look like. Um, the way to write something and then enter it, or up, essentially upload it to that computer or save it, is by hitting shift enter or you can also just click out of the cell if it's a text cell. But I'm gonna do shift enter so you can see that, you know, it is literally just text. Pretty straightforward so far, I hope, right? We're writing and we're reading what we wrote. That's kind of what we do, except there's an extra bit of process here because these are special cells that are meant only for text. Within these cells, we can do some formatting. These understand a kind of markup called markdown. Kind of ironic there. It's a, it's a kind of text markup where if you know a little syntax, you can make it look bigger. Um, you know, so when I give you a document, it's going to have several headings like this, and then with underneath those headings, it's going to have some explanation of what to do. We can also use some formatting to make um, some links.
yeah, so I'm making a link and now you, it's a link that you can click on. Um, again, I'm showing you the basics of how these, uh, how this collab notebook works. Okay. Um, do you have any questions yet? If you do, if, actually, if you have a question, just throw it in the, in the chat. I'm just going to, I'm going to keep moving. Um, this class, we go till 2.30, right? So I think, I think I'm doing okay. Um, all right. So the, the main, I mean, so far we haven't even got to the code part yet, but this is a, a coding environment. So this is a place where you can learn code. This is a place where you can share code with other people. Um, this is a place where you can, um, oh, you got, so if Amber's got a question, good. So I'll get to that in a second. But um, this is also a place where like you can explore different ideas, try different things out and do actually some pretty heavy machine learning operations if you want to with the Colab environment. So Colab is, so Google's doing this pretty nice thing, like you're giving us all these free um, computers basically to, to work on. Um, okay, so errors are good, just as a general statement, Amber has a posted question, how do you do hello this text? Uh, if you mean, how do I make it big like that? I did that by typing a hash mark in front of it. Uh, just the hash symbol there, which shift uh, it's on the number three, but shift on my keyboard, probably yours as well. Um, if you've got an error, I, I don't know how, I don't know, what do the errors say? <laughs> error messages are good, right? Because they tell you, they usually point you to what you did wrong, or they give you a sense anyway. So Amber's typing, so I'm going to take another bite of my cookie. I need some milk. Okay, so if you got syntax errors, that so if, if you're writing text, text is meant to be read. There is no syntax processing on text. So if you got a syntax error, that tells me that you wrote that in a code cell instead of a text cell, because right. So code cells have the understanding that you're writing programming code. You're writing Python. And so if what you write is, is not Python, it's going to say you wrote a syntax error. And um, as a helpful thing, Colab notebooks say, hey, you should search for whatever happens. You should search for it on Stack Overflow to figure out what you did wrong. And that's good. That's helpful uh, if, if you're writing code. But we're not writing code yet. So in fact, I'll try to recreate whatever you did in a code cell. You can tell this is a text cell because you've got the text formatting stuff here, which you can click the buttons to get this different formatting stuff. But a code cell is going to have that play button off to the left. So if I wrote something like that here, it's, you know, nothing's going to happen. I don't know what you did, but if you wrote, hello, this is text without the hash mark, um, you probably would generate an error. Yeah, so you, you, did, you probably did something like this. Um, so that meant, like, what I wrote was not Python, right? So I, I didn't, so, so the, the Python interpreter in Colab Notebook was like, I'm going to write, I'm going to run some Python, um, but it can't because it turns out to be Word. Um, so his question is, do we have to keep saving it as you're writing more code? I'm not sure what you mean. Um, but if you mean like on the right, like when you're writing a text cell, it gives you a preview of it on the right as you're typing. And that's just a helpful thing, but it, it will, it's still there. Like it's, it's kind of there either way. It's not really going away. Like I'm not hitting save. I'm just hitting shift enter to process that bit. All right, so it looks like Amber's okay now. Uh, let me show you a little bit of code and kind of, and then that'll probably be it. I'm, I'm not intending to teach any code today. That's not my plan. I just wanted to show you the place where we will be doing some code uh, so we can kind of separate those conversations between like what is code and what is the platform where we run code. Uh, this is the platform so far. And the main thing I want you to get from today, the main like learning objective or goal is when we're working in a Colab notebook, there are two kinds of cells. And one is text, you write text and people read it. The other is code. You write code and the computer runs that code and does something with it. And so if it doesn't understand what you wrote or you write something and it does something other than what you expected, that's an error in the code and that's what you would work to try to solve. Um, but that's what we do in code. Let me show you a bit of code. I'll, do, I'll just do the classic. Um, I'll just, no, I'm not going to make it more complicated. I'm just going to do the classic hello world. Uh, this is the classic first thing you do when you learn a program, new programming language is you have it say hello to you. And so this is the Python code for writing 
uh, a command to Python to say print hello world. You know what? Actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something else. Um, let's do, because that's kind of confusing because that's what text is already doing. It's just printing itself, itself back. What is this? Um, so if, what if I said, um, let's try it. Let me try something. I actually don't know if this is going to work. Let's see if I can do a little bit of math. Print eight times 15. Oh yeah, great, it worked. I wasn't sure if that would work, and it did. So in that case, I asked Python to do a little math for me, and it ran back. Um, okay, so Bella has a question. Uh, does this only do Python, or can we change code in Java too? This just does Python. Um, like more generically, the concept of coding that I'm using here is called a called a notebook, and there are there do exist notebooks that you can use to run Java or JavaScript or R or other things. Um, but this particular one, the Colab Notebook one, just does the runtime only does Python, and that is the language I intend to um, instruct you all in a little bit because I think it's a good beginning language. So yeah, yep. Um, so yeah, this one just does Python. Okay, so I I didn't mean to get very far into this, and that's all I intended to show you today. Basically, I wanted to introduce the concept of a Colab Notebook. It's a document in the Google file system ecosystem, like a Google, Google Drive thing, but it uses this special app called Colab. And within it, you can create these kinds of documents that are, are, are rich in the sense that they can combine both readable text and executable code in one space. What's really helpful for this is, maybe I can show you an example of one um, that, uh, I don't know if I can, I don't, I don't think I have very good examples of it on, offhand, but maybe I can show you some examples of like how people use these to provide like instruction. So um, let's see if I can find a good demo here to show you kind of how people use these, not necessarily how I'm going to use it, but um, what is all this? Wait, how did I get here? I know what that is, but that's not what I expected to be looking at just then. Here, I want to go to Colab Notebooks. I think it just didn't scroll as fast as I clicked. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me see. Um, this might be a good example or it might not. I don't remember what this is. Let's see, I have a ton of these. Um, oh yeah, okay, good. So this is where I was interested in using a particular um, artificial intelligence thing, and so I, I made a copy of this. Someone else, someone wrote this notebook. I made a copy of it, and so the text that you're reading here are their instructions for what to do and what different options you have as you build what's going on. And then basically, you just like in this case, I just sort of read their instructions and then ran the code cells in order. And then at the end, I had a product that I I was interested in. So most as I'm scamming down here, like someone wrote this. I didn't write this. Someone wrote these instructions, and then they say, okay here's what's about to happen, and then you run the code, and then hopefully it happens. So it's a kind of a self-contained set of steps to follow. And a pretty good way to learn this kind of thing, because all the like hard parts of the code are already written, you just get to do the fun part of like figuring out what to put in it and see what happens. Uh, in this case, this is artificial intelligence that tries to generate music, and basically does a very bad job of it, and it's pretty funny or alarming when it produces what it produces. Um, so I thought I would try different things with it. Um, it's really odd. I don't know. It's called Jukebox. It's, it's, it's a product by OpenAI, which also does uh, GPT, which is a more popular thing that does text generation. But they've also got this product called Jukebox, and I was trying it out, and it's weird. I don't know. <laughs> it, it has a, some people have done things like um, they'll take All Star by Smash Mouth and then try to get this Jukebox to finish the song, and it basically goes in wild other gener different gen musical genres. Um, entertaining but scary like it's often like it sounds like a bunch of people yelling in a room together sometimes um, I guess that's the best way I can describe it it's really bizarre that a computer generated it anyway um, we got a few minutes left and there are a couple of things going on in the news and in the world and I think you know today I'm still trying to build this bigger picture for you of what this class is about um, I've talked about digital math the, the slide here a few slides back introduced or reminded you of the phrase digital methodology. That's where we use digital tools to try to understand the world. And that's what we're going to be doing with code starting next week. Um, the other thing, though, that we can't sort of avoid is this idea of digital culture. And I think that's such a vague term that perhaps you're wondering what that is. It seems like it could be anything and everything because 
or nothing because everything's already digital. But I do think that it is a way of talking about specific uh, things that are going on and, and things that couldn't be going on without like the internet, for example. So there's a podcast I like to listen to called Reply All, and they do a segment sometimes called Yes, Yes, No, where it's usually two hosts, but then they bring in a third host, their boss, I think, and then they look at it together, they look at a tweet, and they try to figure out, do I understand what's going on in this tweet? Because often tweets that go viral have a lot of context and explanation that you have to understand, and all the memes and things have many layers to them, and you have to try to interpret them. So it's kind of a test of digital cultural literacy, I guess. So. Um, I want to present to you two artifacts, and um, again, I, I, I don't have a lot of expertise in these particular areas, but um, maybe you do, and maybe you know what I'm talking about. So this is the first artifact that I would like to propose as having significant digital cultural resonance right now. Um, so if we were on the podcast together, this is where I would ask you, do you understand this? <laughs> and uh, there are many things that we might understand here or might need to be explained about this. Um, so I guess I'll just pose it to you on. You can just type it in chat if you want to take a stab at it. Can you explain this tweet and why it has 240,000 likes, 37,000 retweets? I mean, what are, what are the things, what are the layers you need to kind of pick apart in order to explain this if you do understand it? Okay, right. So stonks is a meme. Um, I used that meme at the opening for this uh, live stream with the meme of the um, sort of su surreal meme man head and the word stonk or stonks. Um, yeah, so GameStop has also <laughs> been a thing. And so this is a portmanteau combining GameStop with stonk. And so the word is now <laughs> game stonk, <laughs> right? All right, so what is the stonks meme? Uh, maybe I mean GameStop is a business, a retailer. Um, but do you understand the Stonks meme? Yeah, yeah. So that's the other layer too. Here's the, the, the poster. Right. So this is Elon Musk, um, famous entrepreneur, uh, who. I have opinions about, but I'm not going to share right now, but um, a well-known person uh, known for kind of trolling people on Twitter and and other things. But this is the, um, yeah, this is who's posting this. And so the fact that he is the one posting this is a big part of the story as well. Yes. And so Kerry is saying this is um, referencing our Wall Street, Wall Street Bets. Wall Street Bets is a subreddit on Reddit. And this is, I believe, a link to that subreddit. I mean, I don't know what, I, it's hard to say what Elon Musk's position is on this. I'm, or maybe he has that, I don't know, I don't really. I try to avoid un <laughs> hearing things about Elon Musk, I find him annoying. Uh, but the, uh, yeah, there's, he has, he has um, many people saw this as an endorsement of what's been going on on, on Reddit over the last week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the GameStop thing is, so Kerry has mentioned um, the GameStop thing. Have you all been following financial news or do you, do you know what the GameStop thing is and why GameStop is the thing that got portmanteaued here? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, so Amber... Yeah, and Brittany, I kind of feel the same way. Like, I kind of, I mean, I get the the uh, ethos of it or the energy of it, like the idea that it's sort of sticking it to the man and trying to rip off billionaires. Like, I get that. I don't really understand the mechanics of it because I don't really understand short selling. Um, I've read articles and watched videos, but I feel like I still don't get it, so I can't really explain it to you. But other than the general sense that I guess GameStop as a retailer, they like many brick and mortar retailers, has really been struggling. There is a type of investment where instead of betting on a stock going up, you bet on it going down. And apparently a lot of hedge funds did this for GameStop. They assumed that it would keep going down and losing value. And then a bunch of people, mostly organized by a subreddit, Wall Street Bets, decided we're going to drive this up. And that basically calls the bet of the hedge funds and 
ends up making them lose a lot of money. I saw something like seventy billion dollars. Um, I mean, it's, it's it still feels like to me the stock market is still like pretend money. Like to me, that doesn't seem like a real thing. But I don't know. Um, it's something that certainly people seem upset about. So it must be real in some way. Uh, and maybe reality just means you know what what you believe about it anyway. Right. And so what this will work as long as yeah, and Amber's actually getting into the, the Robin Hood side of it too. From what I understand, if like, let's say you or I went out and bought um, GameStop stock, it's gonna drive the price up, right? But it, that price will tend to go down if all of us decide, you know what, I gotta get out of this and we sell our stock. And so the rallying, the rallying cry on Reddit has been hold, hold the line, like hold your stock, uh, don't sell. Because if you sell, then it sends the price back down. But I think what's happening now is also what's called like a short squeeze, like, hedge funds are like bailing out and so when they bail out that also drives the price up and then every all the hedge funds that are stuck are stuck in a worse position i think i you know i really i really struggle with the actual financial part of it but the the meme part of it i think really resonated with a lot of people like the idea that like let's just sort of do this for the lulls and um, but like doing it for the lulls is also means like actually causing real financial impact um, this term here like 4chan found the bloomberg terminal uh, it, re it does remind me of like um, other sorts of like online movements, like meme based movements. I thought, what was the other one I just thought of? I don't know, other things. Yeah, it is kind of like the Area 51 stuff, like the sort of let's invade Area 51. But this that one didn't really have any impact. This one seems like it might, um, but I don't know. It just seems like a moment as far as digital culture, and um, maybe so, Pikachu. I mean, maybe I mean memes definitely have that idea of carrying, right? It's, it sort of decreases the friction of something, and it kind of lets it go faster. But is it like um, it, it, they also have a life of their own too? So the idea of a meme is that it's a self self replicating informational structure, and so that's sort of what you see uh, to some extent as well. So yeah, I don't know, Amber. I kind of hope not. I mean, I'm. Excuse me, I'm, um, I'm not invested in the stock market uh, personally, except that you know I have a retirement fund that I think is somehow in the stock market. I don't really understand that part, but I think the fact that I don't understand it doesn't mean I don't, I don't benefit or don't have some position in here. I just don't know what it is. Yeah, I don't know. So, Kerry, yeah, you're really getting into the policy stuff of it. I don't really know. It's uh, It does seem like, and that's some of the discussion is like Robin Hood, I guess, is preventing certain sales and TD Ameritrade is also preventing people from buying and selling certain stocks. Uh, it's not just GameStop now, I guess it's also um, AMC. Um, I saw somebody, and this might've just been a joke, but Blockbuster might be trying to get in on it, but I don't think Blockbuster is publicly traded anymore. Uh, so I don't know if that's possible, but if it is, maybe, you know, chance to get in on the ground before it actually blows up too. Uh, I don't know. It's really, it's really interesting. It does seem really interesting. Um, if you go on Reddit, like most of the front page is people talking about this right now, which is pretty significant that that's the thing going on. So I don't know. I mean, it does seem like in the way, in a way it's kind of like internet populism. It's kind of like, let's the l l little guy kind of, um, you know, take someone down, take, take this hedge fund down a peg. And there's something that does feel good about that. And yet sometimes you see that collective energy and that sort of meme powered sense of agency uh, be really destructive too. Um, so, that's sort of what I'm iffy about with this. Like, it seems like, yeah, let's take down the hedge funds, take down the 1%. Sure, absolutely, I'm all for that. You know, but this energy can be, can very quickly go, go get dangerous or get ugly. I was thinking of like, um, uh, if you remember the Boston Marathon bombing, um, right after that happened, there was a similar kind of like collective intelligence moment where Reddit was like, or people on Reddit were like, we can solve this, let's figure this out. And they named the wrong person and that was incredibly hard. It was someone who had who had gone missing. It turned out he had committed suicide, and so, but it brought all this unnecessary attention on that on that family, and it was really ugly, and it was a big distraction, right? So it was an interesting and really sad example of collective intelligence and enthusiasm and kind of meme powered energy kind of gone wrong. There are other examples like that. That that was just one that popped into my head. But anyway, it's just you know this is a it, this tweet kind of crystallizes the complexity of this digital moment um, with all these different things that are going on. Um, and I thought I'd mention that. The other one that I, I wanted to mention, which I see we're actually out of time for, um, is 
This image, uh, which appeared in the television show WandaVision and led to some interesting discussion. Um, and this would be the other thing that if we had time, I would ask you if you know what this is. Um, WandaVision, I think, is really interesting because it's a kind of, it's a TV show. So on the one hand, they're, it's using the medium of TV, but it's also a TV show that's situated in digital culture. And it is presenting itself in some sense as a puzzle to be solved, which means people are trying to solve it and trying to work together to solve it. So as a, a digital artifacts, it's something that isn't just, when I call it a digital artifact, I don't mean just like literally that it is um, digital video, but that it is something that's being studied and understood and talked about and picked apart by a community that's made possible by digital technology. So it's another artifact of digital technology. Anyway, those are just a couple of things that I think that seemed relevant uh, to this week and I thought I'd mention. Um, I have not seen the latest WandaVision episode, so don't spoil it but if you have any thoughts about the significance of this, this item in the context of WandaVision. This showed up in episode two. Uh, so, you know, it just it seems like one of those things. What I'm doing with these two things is kind of planting seeds. Ultimately, you're going to be creating a big project for this class that could deal with digital culture. And this might be the kind of thing that you want to talk about in some way in your digital project, either, you know, complex TV like WandaVision or, you know, um, meme powered stock bubbles on, on uh, the stock exchange. Uh, might be something still interesting to talk about in a month or two. Okay, so I should wrap it up. Again, uh, on Monday it'll be another live stream, and I will for sure introduce to you all the first actual unit of content for this class, but thanks for watching the stream for today. I hope that demo of Colab Notebooks was helpful because we're going to get into it a little bit next week. Um, again, let me know. All right, um, yeah, no homework yet, so you're good. Um, but just plan on watching a live stream on Monday, and hopefully I'll have structure to show you, some actual structure to show you uh, for the class. But thanks for bearing with me. I'm getting slowly adjusted to the new schedule. I, I, I'm, I feel like I'm still physically recovering from the winter term, but I'm just about there. Um, all right, cool. So thanks for watching, everyone. Um, I guess, you know, go buy some GameStop stock. I guess. Actually, don't. I don't know. I mean, it's going to come back down eventually, right? Like, that's the, that's the big question. Um, probably not. All right, cool. See you all. Have a good weekend. I'm going to wrap up the stream, but I'll stay online if you have any questions or want to chat anymore. See you later.